but now it's been two weeks since I've isolated, one week in the, since my positive test. Yeah. And it got way worse. And I just kind of lost it one day and I was out in that balcony and I th- at the hotel and I threw this chair like as far as I could and I was like swearing at the top of my lungs and I felt so bad after for the hotel staff because they were so worried about me. Yeah, like, well your brain's not working properly at all. You're, like, yeah. you're not sleeping, you've been trapped in this place, you've been unwell, like you're not yourself at all. Imagine being trapped in a hotel room for three weeks battling the full force of coronavirus with no human interaction to keep you sane. That's the level of torment Joe Patterson has just been subjected to. He was finally cleared of COVID-19 a few days ago and wasted no time sharing his roller coaster of a story to give us a brutal insight into what it's really like to catch this virus and encourage everyone to take it deadly serious. It's a horrific illness and I was probably one of the ones early on when it started to happen. In late Feb, Joe had just moved to Scotland with his girlfriend for what he thought would be the second year of his PhD. A fortnight later, he was in a mad dash back to Australia in a world turned upside down by the pandemic. Through the worst of it, Joe was coughing up blood and losing his mind. Now he's back to full health and never imagined he'd be so grateful to go for a walk and buy a coffee. And I've never interviewed someone so excited about having a face-to-face interaction with me. The idea that you know you can't have face-to-face contact and I don't think I've ever been more grateful for that than in the last couple of days since I've been cleared. His story is an example of the light at the end of the tunnel and a reassurance that social distancing and self-isolation is absolutely necessary. Even speaking to doctors and things like that when I was in at the RA, they still think that spike's coming. Here it is in vivid detail like you've never heard it before. Welcome to Young Blood, a podcast all about young men's health. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our mission to talk about the stuff that matters and isn't talked about enough. Let's do it. Uh, so at the fe- end of February, you were heading to Scotland for what you thought would be the next 12 months. Yeah. And you were pumped. Yeah. And you went over there with your missus. And uh, yeah. So tell us about what that was like. Well, so I was heading over there as a part of a PhD scholarship that I got. I was one year into the PhD, which I was technically doing at a Perth uni. The second year of it, you had to be in Scotland, Aberdeen, northeastern Scotland. And the idea was is that we moved across that we we're going to move across there, me and my partner, get set up, get a flat, and then I would start studying. I was working on a book, and I was going to be spending a lot of time traveling around Scotland, interviewing people, speaking to people with this sort of stuff. So we got there, and as we got there, back here in Australia, this sort of coronavirus. Um, thing was just starting to happen. The cases were happening. There was the stuff with the cruise ships. People were sort of more and more cases were being reported. That hadn't really hit the UK yet. As we got there, Scotland hadn't even, I'm pretty sure Scotland hadn't even had a case yet. Within, we we were having a lot of trouble getting settled like in the country. You know, moving to another country is not easy, even if it is the UK. No. Yeah. They're like, trying to open a bank account, trying to set up phones, all this stuff. It's even harder when there's- Yeah, you had plenty to do. Yeah, and it's even harder when there's sort of, you know, Brexit slash a pandemic sort of looming in the distance. So I got established at the uni, which was University of Aberdeen, a beautiful old uni. I had a great support network there. And we'd been in Scotland for roughly 14 days. So not very long at all, really. Yeah, Had a flat, you know, paying rent, open bank accounts and- yeah. I'd just been put into the university system. Got there, got to the university one day, and I just had access to emails in the system, like a Wi-Fi and whatnot. Yeah, how were you feeling about it all at this time as well? Like pretty exciting, obviously. First, I, I'd only just started to get excited at this point because all of the other headaches that had happened, I really hadn't had a chance to sort of focus on what I was there to do. Yeah, and then just as it started to go well. My partner, she was applying for jobs, you know, all of a sudden we could go to visit all these beautiful places around Scotland. It got really real. Yeah. That lasted about a day because we got, I got into the university one morning and I just noticed that there was nobody there. Like not nobody, but a very, it was quite quite a busy university. I was in my office, I was looking out the window, it was like 9am on a Wednesday and there's nobody walking around. I opened up my emails and there was an email that went out to all higher degree students that said, we're putting an indefinite ban on field work. Because my book is a nonfiction book about travel, it's all field work. It's all going out. And I kind of looked at this email and I thought, oh shit, what do I do now? Like I, I had no idea what to do. I hadn't know nobody really told me what was next. So I like had this sort of wave of dread come over me. I was because I kind of knew instantly what that meant. And that meant that I was going to have to come home. 
while all of this is going on. Were you thinking like, surely not though? Like, yeah, but well, p- part of me wanted to just write it out. Yeah, of course. Well, you, you just know? made all this effort to go all the way over there. And with the other pandemics that we've had in the past, like swine flu and uh, the other recent ones, they haven't gone that far. Yeah, and they pass, yeah. you know. And the thing is, is you know, the, the problem with the, this PhD structure, it was a, it was a 12-month period. When I kept thinking, and it was kind of a cynical way of thinking about it, I suppose, I kept thinking, I was just like, what if it goes for eight months? And that's kind of the way that it was being talked about in the media. It was just like, we don't know how long this is going to go on for. Yeah. And already the UK was starting to say words like lockdown. Mm. And it had happened within like a two-week period. So so what was the date around there? Because I think in Australia, it was probably the second week of March that it started to really kick off yeah and it was like it went from a, a low hum where everyone was like oh you know whatever it'll be fine sort of thing to a oh shit like yeah it, it won't be i think it was the 16th of march yeah so it was 16th of march which i believe is was the wednesday i could be completely wrong with that but around that and i what i did is i sent an email quickly to my supervisor and i said what do i do here like while all of this is going on mind you there's all of the talk about australia closing borders so there's all of these different things coming in. Me and my partner are talking about it. We're like, you know, we need to go home, but can we go home? Should we go home? You yeah. Know? And so like that, your life together, which you've just done all this work to set up and got all the accounts sorted, all the study, you're like, right, I got this going. It's going to be like this. How good? And we've just had this like really good day together the other day. Yeah. And then bang, like it's all gone to shit. Hit you like a ton of bricks. What was that like? And the poor girl, like, I've dragged her to Scotland with me. She doesn't yeah. have a job, right? And um, it was it was like I was saying, I just got excited to sink my teeth into it. It was a golden opportunity, an opportunity that I'd worked really hard for to get. Yeah. And then there was that aspect of denial where I was just like, it's going to be fine. And then when it finally dawned on me that it wouldn't be, it was it was devastating. Yeah. Like I was in I was in shambles, but I couldn't really let myself just sort of be completely overrun by how flattening it was i needed to make a decision fast because you had to act had to act had to get home so on that wednesday afternoon i messaged my supervisors and said i've just got this email saying i can't do what i was brought here to do and it's a government it was a government scholarship Mm. so i was getting paid to do it so you know there's that i had to consider as well and then they um they said to me all of my supervisors kind of got back to me on that wednesday afternoon and said we think you need to go home but you need to do it now so so much pressure so much pressure so we sat we sat down and we're like how can we actually do this logistically aberdeen's in northeastern scotland there's not international flights really going that you can get on a plane there and then start heading back to australia yeah it'd be a logistical head fuck not really. that straightforward yeah yeah so we had to get to london and so uh. we had to get to london on friday and this was wednesday night that i found out that i was leaving and so that, that on the thursday we raced around and packed up the the life that we essentially had started there. We had to pack into boxes, find somewhere to put a lot of the, you know, bo- uh, bed sheets and towels and all this sort of stuff yeah. that we bought. You must have just been running on adrenaline as well because yeah. this isn't something that you've ever felt before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and once again, you're kind of denying it until you're on the plane, yeah. right? You know, you've, you've- Well, you don't want it to be true. No, of course not. Like, yeah. you know, so we- The only way we could get down to London was to- Get an overnight bus, a fourteen-hour bus, down to London, and then like you, you know, you're going on buses and you're going in airports and you're moving, yeah, really long distances, and you've got to have in your mind like this isn't ideal for not the getting, virus. Your, yeah. But the thing is, the funny thing is, is that at the time when the decisions were taking place, we really weren't thinking about the virus. We were sort of individualizing the situation about the direct impact it was having on our lives at the time, which was that we had to stop doing what we were doing and we yeah. had to put this amazing opportunity on hold yeah actually getting it was the furthest thing from your mind yeah, sort of, and that's that furthest thing from a lot of people's minds right now yeah you know people don't think you're going to get it until you've got it yeah or you know somebody who's got it then we so we got on this overnight bus and so how many how long did they say you had to get out we had about we because it's no, so nobody knew what was going on with the borders the conversation was that the international flights were going to stop from particular airlines so i think some of the airlines had already stopped like maybe qatar had already stopped um doing international flights into australia um so lo and behold by the time we got back just fast forward uh, a bit they 
we flew Emirates and they ended up the next day stopping international flights. So if we'd left it one more day, 12 hours even, we wouldn't have got into the country and we would have been stuck somewhere. Mm. Um, so the university, Curtin University in Perth, who were organising all of this for me, they, they booked us a flight from London on the Saturday morning. The Friday, we were like, we need to get to London. The domestic flights, because everybody was sort of panicking in the UK, the domestic flights were like you know $600 for a 40-minute flight. So we got on this bus. What was the vibe like when you were traveling around as well at that time? Well, this was in, when we, by the time we got on the bus, was the first time that I started to really dawn on me about the virus because you had people getting on and off the bus wearing the masks, the gloves, the glasses, wiping down their bus seats with yeah. disinfectant. You know, they're, everybody was like pouring hand sanitizer into strangers' hands just to make sure that the bus would be safe because it's such a long time to be sitting in proximity to other people. Yeah. And that's when it really started to dawn us that, like, you know, this is a really dangerous thing to be doing, the travelling when it was at its sort of apex um, in the UK. And you must have been able to tell that everyone was sort of nervous and it had that that vibe to it where people were freaked out. Oh, man, when people cough, like everybody sort of shudders. Like, if some, you know, there's a thousand and one reasons to cough, but people, they're instantly they think that person's got the coronavirus. Yeah, like, you know, so people, anxious. Yeah, and it, it's rightfully so because there was sort of this fear had been built up um, and there was a sort of really starting to settle on the people, particularly in the UK. We got on this bus in down into London, then had to get another two-hour bus or something out into Stansted Airport. When we got to the airport, we were like, right, let's get masks and gloves and hand sanitizer. We're going to be on a flight for the next 24 hours. We'll be travelling for the next 24 hours to come home. All the while, we're sort of grappling the idea of the fact that we've just had to abandon our lives. Like, it was very draining emotionally. Oh, yeah. And then... yeah. Got At least you had each other. Exactly. That time. Oh, know? I think I, if I wasn't for her, I would have been a mess. Like I I probably wouldn't have even come back. I would have just been like, I'll ride it out and sit in this flat. That would have been a bad idea. Yeah, really <laughs> bad. <laughs> but you probably wanted to hold it together partly to be strong for her as well. Yeah, exactly. And because, you know, she had had to, she changed so many things in her life. And for me, like she was deciding to you come You felt like me. it was your fault. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I felt guilty. Like I felt, I brought you here during this time and then now i'm going to take you home like she's been nothing but amazing yeah but, you know it only sort of got worse from there but we then we're in stanford airport and there's nowhere selling gloves there's nowhere selling masks there's a, we were really surprised about how there was no sort of access to the tools that we needed mm. to, to protect ourselves there were people on the flights who had masks on and were being really diligent but without that stuff you, you in every sense of the word, you were trapped because you're sitting between two two people on a plane and you're going to be there for 14 hours. Mm. You know, that person next to you got coronavirus. There's nothing you can do and about it. And so that's it. what happened? Well, we actually don't know. So we- But you had to sit there with nothing on and yep. know that. Yeah. All of the sort of staff on the planes wore masks and gloves mm. um, and they sort of kept as much distance as they could. Um, but if all the passengers don't can't get access to the stuff- then What good is it? It's not great. Yeah. yeah. So then we got on the- got on the flight and we actually got separated in the second flight. So we flew from London into uh, Dubai and we sat next to each other and that was fine. And then we flew from Dubai into Adelaide and on that second flight we were separated. And this is where I don't really know what happened because we, we, we weren't surrounded by people who were coughing much. We weren't some people who looked unwell. The people in our respective rows seemed quite healthy and fine, but you just don't know because people don't know when they've got it themselves yeah and everybody was just trying to get home everybody didn't know when the flights were going to stop from the uk into australia um and you know from everywhere else around the world for that matter so everybody just was trying to get home so there was this there was a huge there was a large amount of tension on the plane mm. it's just going to be in the air or like on the toilet door handle like. exactly and you just don't know you know on on your, your headrest you know from somebody walking past going to the toilet yeah so you know we got back into australia and then we're going through the airport in Adelaide and it's it was fascinating, you know, we've all had these those flights back home and sort of that grueling process where you stand at immigration. But while you're doing that, there's people coming around taking your temperature and you're filling out these special forms that will that we have to put down an address and that address is where you're gonna be for the next fourteen days. Yeah. So everybody coming back into the country had to isolate for fourteen days and you needed to say where you were gonna be. And coming home is usually a good thing after all that effort and you've usually gone and had some amazing experience and then you're 
you're glad to be home. Whereas yeah. this was just the beginning of your torment. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it was, and it, the, the one thing that made it really hard for the both of us was that it took us from one extreme to the other. We were so mobile and everything that we had done was so mobile. We're traveling around, we're exploring the new city in Scotland, you know, we're going out to bars, moving around, walking everywhere. Then all of a sudden you come back home, which you weren't meant to be at. And it's like, all right, sit in this room for two weeks. And that's best case scenario. Yeah, and not together either. Not together. So what, at this point we were. So okay. we had the opportunity to isolate together. Yeah. We isolated at her place. And this was on the Sunday. We got back in Sunday night. And we sort of set up our, you know, how we were going to live and how we were going to be really careful about what we touched and whatnot if, yeah. if anybody else had to be in our proximity. Have they tested you at that point? Uh, no, they don't test you when you come back into the country. I don't know if that's changed now. They just check your temperature. Oh, okay. And if your temperature Unless you off, have symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was is we, four or five days had passed um, and my partner, she started to get really sick and she had a dry cough, which is obviously one of the most sort of obvious symptoms. And I had a really bad fever. I was sort of sweating, you know, profusely. I couldn't really get comfortable Um and so we caught, we didn't really know what to do. This is, we'd been back for four days, and this was They're a, starting to feel fairly nervous at that point. Yeah, because they say, you know, about that five day mark is when you start to show symptoms. Five days after when you came into contact with it, everybody's different, but it was at that point. So we we didn't really know how that we you go about getting tested, you know, because you on one hand you're meant to be isolating, and the cops are coming by and checking that you're there, and. On the other hand, you know, it's paramount that you go get tested to ensure that you're clear. So we just called our local GP and we're like, what do we do? And they're like, okay, we can test you rather than going to the you know, Royal Adelaide. They're like, we can test you. You know, drive here all masked up and gloved up into the car park of our local GP clinic. And then one of our doctors came out to our car and swabbed us. And you're thinking, you're both thinking like, we've got it. Yeah. We, it was pretty clear at that point that something was amiss. But so the ne- so we went home and that day, which was a Thursday or a Wednesday, I can't remember. And after that point, we started to feel a lot worse. Like the next 24 hours while you're awaiting your results, we started to feel a lot worse. So it was obvious. Like, well, we've, you know, we've got it. We've got the virus. Yeah. And just explain, like, how did you feel? At that point, at that point, it was for me, because there's such a broad spectrum of symptoms. And they, for me in particular, over the course of the entire illness, they reared their head at different points at that when i didn't know I, if i had it i had a really bad fever like that sort of fluey sweat that you get um i wasn't coughing my partner she was coughing a lot we um i was feeling like that sort of muscle ache as well but this was the next morning she gets a phone call saying yes you you're testing positive and i sort of sat there and i was like well what about me yeah. When do I get my results? Talking to the doctor and the doctor's like, your results haven't come back yet. Our tests must have got separated when they went into the system. Right. So but, I mean, you've been living together. So yeah, you're, you're sharing a like, bathroom, you're sharing a bed, you're sharing yeah. like every single surface that she touches, I touch. Like it's, yeah. it was pretty obvious. Then, so for the rest of that day, just in case, the doctor was like, can you stay at opposite ends of the house? Yeah. Then I get a phone call that afternoon on the, on the Friday afternoon, it was a Friday, Friday afternoon, so 24 hours after we've been tested, I get a phone call, they said, you're negative. And I've gone, how is that even possible? You know, they've got people standing 1.5 metres apart from everybody out in public. We've been having, we've been closer than 1.5 for five days in a row. Yeah, much closer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the sort of thing, like how, you can't, you can't, you know, it, it'd be impossible. And they're like, well, it's negative, you need to get out of the house now. So at that point, I was like, faced with like I had no I had no options left I couldn't go back home to live with my mum and dad because I didn't that's not how it works I can't go and hop in with them just in case I do have it even though my test was negative I couldn't stay there with her so my doctor was sweating me they were like yeah you got to get out and so I literally packed a backpack put my playstation in the backpack <laughs> the essentials the essentials my laptop forgot clothes and everything, <laughs> and everything else and then <laughs> I just started walking. And so we, Fucking hell, man. we were down the beach and I just started That's walking. That's so grim. <laughs> Mask on. Jesus. Um, 
so I started walking towards the airport because I knew there were hotels there. Yeah. And I knew that a lot of people were isolating and no in hotels. One's organizing anything for you. It's all happening too fast. Yeah. I got to, as far as I'm concerned, there's somebody next to me who's got coronavirus. I don't get away from them. Yeah. Is what they were telling me. SA, I hadn't been in contact with SA Health at this point, just my doctor, my, my own GP. Mm. So I started walking and I was just going to walk to one of those airport hotels because we were close enough to the airport. Yeah. And I. And you know, um, you're walking probably with coronavirus as well. Yeah. Because I've got no other option. I don't have a car. I can't, yeah. I can't drive. I can't get in a taxi. Yeah. At least if I was walking, I could like see people and like avoid, avoid them it. massively. Um, lo- all this entire time, I didn't have a phone because I'd got, got a UK phone um, SIM card, which stopped working the minute I got back in Australia. So there was no way for anybody to contact me. Because uh, you were thinking, well, I won't need an Australian one for ages. Yeah. So I just cancelled my plan uh, and I couldn't get into it. Okay. I couldn't get into a store to get a number. So nobody could contact me when I was walking to this hotel absolute coincidence my mum drove past because she was going to take some clothes to me at my my partner's place right she was like what are you doing she's like what's happened so i I explained it to her and i was like i've got to get into isolating by myself right now and finish my isolation somewhere neutral when i'm Mm. not in contact with people she's like my mum she was like a hero she was like right we're going to get you a hotel they came and dropped my car off for me and left me my car with the keys in it. So I didn't get, come close to a single other human being. Yeah. Finally, they found this hotel for me on Anzac Highway, Morfordville Motor Inn. And they put me in put me in a room. And so after that, I actually had a day where I felt completely fine. I was like, I must have been negative. You know, I yeah. feel fine. And yeah, I don't yeah. know whether it was sort of- The stress sort of went down for it because you had a moment to rest. At least you were- yeah, something like that, or whether I had just convinced myself that I was fine and yeah. I, that I dodged a bullet, essentially, which is but what would have happened. The power of the mind, you know, because they've come through and said you're negative and you're like, well, they wouldn't have got that wrong. Yeah, how do you get that wrong, yeah. right? They shove a swab right up your nose and yeah. down your throat. Like, how does it miss? Yeah, like, is it really uncomfortable? It oh, looks super uncomfortable. It was like a scratch in your brain. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, then I stayed in this hotel for a day. And at that point, I, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to stay in this hotel for a week. That would be my 14 days from when I got back from the UK, a few days in my girlfriend's place, and then the rest of the days here in this hotel. That would be the t- 14 days. I'll be fine. This was a Sunday, so it's been exactly- nope. <laughs> nah, No way. It had been exactly <laughs> one week since I got back. Yeah. And then I remember waking up on a Sunday and I could like barely move. I was like really finding it difficult to sort of breathe. I, I was coughing a fair bit and I basically just felt like I'd been hit by a bus. Called my doctor again was like, you know, I know I got a negative test three days ago, but let's be honest, you know, it, it, it can't, that can't be the case. I can't, I can't feel like this and be living with somebody with the virus and not have it. And she was like, I agree, get to the RA. So I've driven to the RA for another test on the Monday or masked up and the RA looks like, like they're killing it over there. They're just, the staff that they're, they're just made the best out of the very worst situation. They've got everything under control. Yeah. But it's like a, it's like a zombie movie. There's like tents set up outside. There's yeah. everybody. And they had the, the entrance for the corona patients separate to the rest Yeah, as well. you follow like yellow um, arrows on the ground from the car park. And if you've got uh, corona symptoms, you can only follow these arrows yeah. to get to the testing. Got my test then. Next day, yeah, positive. You've got coronavirus. And I was just like, well, like, I know. N- no shit. <laughs> yeah. Like I've, at this point, I think I've had it for five or six days already. But yeah. technically, that's my day one. So they're like, from today, which was the Monday, a week already into isolation, they're like, now your 14 days starts. Uh They're like, so you're going to be in that hotel room for 14 days. Mm. And I was just like, okay, right, let's get comfy. Mm. Well, you really like, though, knowing that that was going to be what you had to do the next couple of weeks. To be completely honest, my first thought was, with the work I do, you know, doing the, the writing and the external teaching, these I actually thought that it was going to be fine. Like it yeah. wouldn't, I didn't think that I would have so much time to think. Mm. Um, what I didn't account for was how stifling the virus was in terms of health. Uh, like physically. Physically, yeah. Do you think you're going to be able to do some writing and yeah, get read some stuff and, done? And, yeah. Mm. And, you know, because that's, that's how I spend my downtime anyway. Yeah. But as that week went on, it got worse and worse and worse. You know, the, the illness did. There were, there were days where, and, you know, you also got to think in a hotel room, you're always like two meters away from a bed. So 
your instinct is to be in that bed. And especially when you're sick, everybody's telling me, my family, my doctors, they're like, you know, use this time to rest, but you don't want to rest because time goes so slow when you're sitting in a bed, mm. in a room. Especially where you when you're unwell. People. Exactly. And then- And what about like, what health care were you receiving? Because you, they're like, okay, you're positive. You've got coronavirus. You've got to go and stay in this room. Is anyone coming and giving you drugs or helping you or- No, and this isn't to, this is the thing that I, I had a bit of a problem with. And this isn't, isn't to, you know, say that anybody was doing anything wrong because at the end of the day, nobody knows still to this day what's going on with the virus. Every day it changes. Every day the rules mm. change. But actually throughout this entire period, there were very few times where somebody told me how to handle the virus. What they care about is how your isolation it's is going. not spreading it. And, whether, and how long until you're clear. Mm. So my doctor would call me every day and they'd go through a checklist and that would be it, right? Mm. Until I'd done that for a week. So now it's been two weeks since I've isolated, one week in the, since my positive test. Yeah. And it got way worse. The virus did. Got so bad that I thought I needed an ambulance. And, and in what way? So I, at the top of every breath I took, I could feel this sort of huskiness. And if I got up to go to the bathroom from the bed that I was, you know, sitting and sweating, I felt like I'd just gone for a, you know, 5K run. Um, and I was sweating and I could like barely sort of lift myself up. I also coughed up blood that day. I like went into the bathroom and, and my partner throughout all this, she's going through a similar thing away from me, but I, cause technically she's a couple of days ahead. I kind of knew what was coming down the pipeline and I remember coughing and it was sort of just like a light spray in the sink and I was like, I've got to go to, to hospital. So I drive myself into the RA, um, and they take you in, into these airlock rooms with like an intercom because they're trying to contain it in the best way possible. They took all my heap of blood. They took a heap of x-rays in my chest and sort of deemed me okay to go home. Mm. You just feel like you're in some sort of movie. Yeah. It just, it felt so surreal. And then after that, that, that day in the RA, they essentially told me that it would be another two weeks from there. So every time I got to- Because oh, you got exposed again? Yeah. So- that at that point is when it really started to affect me, like mentally. Yeah. Like I was, I was exhausted. Because you've been, you've been through a lot, man. Like running on adrenaline, being unwell, traveling a massive distance, having your plan of what you thought your life was going to be shattered all at once without getting a break for yeah. like weeks. At that point, already, yeah, like you must have been on empty. And then they said you have to go another two and, weeks. And you described it perfectly because I don't think I'd thought about it all as a as an entire experience yeah. until this point. Because you'd just be thinking next thing because yeah. you're in survival mode. Get better. You know, what do I need to do to get back into work, back into my PhD? What do I need to do? And yeah. and then, yeah, I was just, I, I was just like defeated by it. I was just like, I'm going to be in this hotel room forever. Yeah. Like, it's genuinely what I felt. And like, what would happen is, you know, I had a microwave and a, and a kettle. So you're not eating well. No. Right, and you need to be sort of eating like it's well, like two minute noodles, and yeah, and who's noodles. even giving you food? Like, where are you getting that? So, my sisters and my mum were, and some of my mates as well, they would come and bring supplies and just leave them at the door of the hotel room mm. and then go. Yeah. And that was the most I had, you know. You, you obviously, we at this time, you know, got all access to all sorts of things like Uber Eats and whatnot, yeah. And people were so generous, like my friends, you know, offering to bring me stuff, and my family were amazing throughout the entire time. Mm. But it's still not human contact at all. And it's still not what you need, you know, like in terms of food and things like that. And so but I mean, and I totally I feel you on that, but at least you had that as well. Like imagine being in that situation with no no loving friends and family to help you too. Like oh, that, that must have happened to some people too. Exactly. And that's what I started to think about. What if this has happened to me in Scotland? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like well, I didn't know anyone. Yeah. And, you know, at least and if my, they had to separate me and my partner in Scotland. So that was- I kept reminding myself if there was a reason that I came back here. Mm. But, and you had to try and be grateful in, in the worst circumstance that it wasn't worse than it was. Oh, yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like some people, like most people have had it far worse than I did. And like in terms of how the illness affected me, like, you know, I'm I'm fine now. Yeah. And, but know. don't underplay it. I mean, you were fucking coughing up blood. Yeah, so. I know. So was my partner as well. So yeah. she had to go into the raw at a different point as well. So we, and the worst part is, is we have no idea where we got it. Like- you know, we think we could have even got it in the Adelaide airport because that's now what, you know, with a lot of people have. Yeah, and it's just like you'd never know because yeah, you never know. Been, can't trace it. Could have been absolutely everywhere. But then also just explain like you also um, have had or do have clinical depression anyway. So yeah. 
this would be a really tough circumstance for anyone to be in where they're going to struggle in that sort of an environment. But then for you, you had that pre-existing condition as well. So yeah. just talk a bit about that. Well, I haven't sort of, depression hasn't really reared its head for me in a few years. Like I had a, I had a really bad stint with it and back, you know, maybe in like 2016, 2017, but this was kind of the first time where I sort of felt like those feelings coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so overwhelming. It's, it was so overwhelming. And like, I'm sort of the person where I could easily convince myself that I love my own company and that, you know, being somebody who writes like pretty much full time, like being by yourself is it's like kind of a golden opportunity. Yeah, but if you can't even really focus on that because you're so unwell. Exactly. That's a different ballgame. Exactly. And then you just, you I was constantly reminded by the things I couldn't do. You know, I was constantly reminded that I couldn't have this human interaction. And this is where it's, I saw somebody on Twitter the other day describe it as sort of social torture. The idea that you know you can't have face-to-face -face contact and i don't think i've ever been more grateful for that than in the last couple of days since i've been cleared mm. you know i am somebody who likes to keep to myself and when i was really depressed you know those few years back i i kept to myself as a coping mechanism but this was different i felt those same feelings but all i wanted to do was to be around my family or be with my partner or be with you know my my mates and it was sort of i would sit there i'd wake up in the morning in this hotel the my work had stopped at this point because, you know, I had coronavirus. They're like, you know, you're not working. Like, just focus on getting better. Um, the PhD had been put on hold. Other writing projects I was working on on the side, some freelance stuff, that was all put on hold. And then I'd wake up in the morning and I'd get out of bed and I'd be like, why am I even getting out of bed? To do what in this hotel room? Like, to watch Netflix for the, for the 10th hour in the last 12 hours or, you know, to make an instant coffee in the corner? Like... And so I just hop back in bed and I just sit there all day and I, and you know, I have also got insomnia, so I don't sleep and you need to sleep to get better. So I, I found- So you're caught in this weird limbo. Yeah. You people were talking about now how they don't know what day it is. Like I certainly didn't know what day it was. Like I had this little balcony outside the hotel and I couldn't even go out there just in case there was somebody staying in the room next to me. So I had no vitamin D. The blinds were kind of drawn the entire time. So yeah, I started to really- in every sense of the word, lose my mind. Like I started to, there, I remember days where I was like measuring the room, like just just for something to do, like measuring how big the room was, which was a stupid decision because it was like the dimensions of a prison cell. But, you uh -huh. know, it's, it, and it, it was not, nothing like that. Like I still, the, the hotel staff were amazing. <laughs> Imagine you like scratching on the walls, <laughs> like what day it is. You know? Tallying it all up. <laughs> yeah. Giving myself tattoos <laughs> with a prison pen. And Doing like a self diary type yeah. of thing. Well, I did do that. That was one yeah. of the way, the one of the ways that I sort of got through it is I wrote about how I was feeling each day mm. because I try to do that periodically anyway in my day to day life, and I kind of had neglected it through all this craziness. And I figured yeah. one one way to sort of to articulate your feelings, which is this goes, this is sort of universal. Yeah, you know? that's a good idea. If you are depressed, I know a lot of people who suffer from depression write about how they feel when they feel better. It's kind of a vice. Yeah, and if you're a writer, then right. second nature, right? Yeah. Um, Have you looked at that since? No, I haven't. I've done that on purpose. I kind of want to forget about it. Um, yeah. Despite me here talking about Just it right be now. Be positive though for for a while. Yeah, and and kind of like do the small things that I need to get done, and then I can reflect on it later. You need a bit more space from it. Yeah, you yeah. need that separation, and things are just starting to go back to normal. And normal is relative right now. Yeah. It's still the world is still sort of suffering from it. And so in that stint, uh, when you say you're, you're measuring up the room and the days sort of all flowed into one. But how many days do you reckon before you were like, I think I'm losing it? There was probably like four or five days where it was really bad. And I remember I had um, I had a really bad day where um, my mum had come to drop off some stuff for me. And as she arrived, I was talking. And this is where I talk about how the rules were changing every day about what we could and couldn't do. We were told that if you get two negative tests, then you were cleared. Um, if you worked in health. If you don't work in health, we were told that if you just go three days without symptoms, you're clear. And essentially, we were being, t we were, my, the people were driving out to test my partner and they were inconclusive tests. So they just kept saying, stay. And I just kind of lost it one day. And I was out in that balcony and I th at the hotel and I threw this chair like as far as I could. And I was like swearing at the top of my lungs. And I felt so bad after for the hotel staff and because they were so worried about me. They were, the hotel staff were, they couldn't come in and clean the room, of course. And they were just sort of, you know, trying to bring me food and trying to look after me. And they were amazing. And I just felt, I, I felt so ungrateful because like I said, I wasn't that, the people had it far worse, but like- it, it just, Yeah, but it's, it's all relative and you had it pretty bad. Yeah. You know? 
and there's there's only so much anyone else can do for you. Like that's yeah. such an odd situation where you're genuinely trapped in that circumstance and you just have to wait it and out. And that's like my mum. Like she she was awesome and then she just said to me, she's like, I want to help. And I was just kind of like, you can't. Like, mm. you know, you've done everything you can do. You've done and then some. At the end of the day, like it's me trapped in this room and there's nothing I can do about it. And then yeah, so at, at that so point, what, you, where did you throw the chair? I I threw the chair on the balcony because I my partner had been told that she had to continue to isolate, even though that she'd been told if she got that she could go free and that ended up happening to me a couple of days later and it's nobody's fault because like I said the rules change you know towards the end of my time I got told if you wake up without symptoms tomorrow you can leave the hotel so I'm the next morning I'm waking up and I'm packing up the hotel my hotel room and they call me like oh no no you need two negative tests and I'm like I'm already checking out the hotel different information yeah and that was really bad because my feelings were just like we're just changing because I would I'd be thinking oh I'm free tomorrow like I can go to the supermarket like I can I can not free, but like I can go for a walk. Yeah. And then Anything. I get a phone call and they're like, no, no, you got to stay there for another yeah, two days. So it was the building up the expectation and then getting it taken away again yeah. and again. And that's what happened with my partner and it really defeated her. So I was on the phone to SA Health and I, I got really mad, which was completely unreasonable on my behalf. But all of my reactions to everything at this point were unreasonable. Yeah. Like, well, your brain's not working properly at all. You're like, yeah. you're not sleeping. You've been trapped in this place. You've been unwell. Like, you're not yourself at all. Yeah. And I haven't spoken to anybody face to face in three weeks at this point. So like you kind of it's it, you yeah. kind of lose like it felt like a castaway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was that close to painting yeah. basketball. I will. Yeah. <laughs> and then I just lost it, and I sort of I like had that I had a moment. My mum was standing down there, and she couldn't even comfort me because she's standing down there, and I was just like in tears. I was just like, this is. I was like, this is fucked. Like I just want to get out. Like I just want to go and go back to normal. Like, yeah. and that's when everything is compounded. I was like, I should be in Scotland right now writing a book. Like two two weeks ago, and at this point, I had a, a bad realization. I'd been in this hotel room by myself longer than I was in Scotland, and so I was I was thinking I was just like I don't even know what day it is. I don't know what time it is. I you know yeah, it's too much. It's too much. You know, and then you get emails. You got to pay your rent in Scotland. <laughs> God, like yeah, man. So it just got it just got really bad there for a few days. I ended up pulling myself back together a bit and sort of. When I at that point I was starting to the symptoms were starting to fade. Yeah. So how long had you been feeling like shit for? I would I would have been like fourteen days feeling like shit, um, with a five or six day period of feeling like incapacitated almost. That's a pretty long time, isn't it? It's a long time, yeah. yeah. And um, it was, yeah, it was, and you I feel like such a prick because somebody will ask you like, how are you? Somebody will message you on Facebook. One of my friends will message me on Facebook. They're like, how are you? And I was like, how the fuck do you think I am? Like, I'm in a hotel room. I've been here for three weeks. I haven't had sun on my skin. Yeah. Like, and then, you know, now I'm sort of being like, you know, there was a lot of unreasonable behavior in that period. But then at the same time, like, you know, it, to me, it sort of showcased personally how much I did need to, to speak to other people. And because mm. I convinced myself I didn't need that. I convinced myself that I could sit in a room and write all day and I'll be fine. I don't care about yeah. other people. I don't like other people. <laughs> and then now it's, Even for an introvert, it's just way too much. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's the idea of like, it's not like, oh, I can sit in here and if I want to see people, I can. Like when somebody yeah. tells you you can't speak to anybody. And you can't go outside. Can't go outside. Then, you know, it's like forbidden fruit. Then all of a sudden that's all you want, mm. you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyone needs to have the option. Yeah, of course. You know. So, yeah, man. And then it was only, you know, today we're filming this on Monday, but this is um, only Saturday where I got my second negative test. And then what happened was is I just said to SA Health, because the hotel was costing – my parents were putting up the hotel and it was costing a lot of money to mm. keep, keep me in a hotel. And, of course, most people by this time are getting free hotels who yeah, are coming back. because we just miss that kind of whole yeah. thing because, like, you know, that started to happen sort of after and they don't want to move you, which is completely fair enough. Why would they risk mm. you to more, to more exposure? Yeah. And then we um, – when they told me, like, oh, you can go the next day if you don't have symptoms, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go. And then they called me as I had packed up my – cesspit of a hotel room at this point yeah um must have been filthy oh it was filthy like shocking like you're doing everything in the same room like yeah um, they're like just burn this room yeah they have to, they have to leave it for like three days or something like that so, uh, and like not touch it it's so, like chernobyl yeah exactly like chernobyl and then um they yeah so then i said like i'm just going to go home and finish off my isolation there so then all of a sudden then now I did need to get these two consecutive negative tests and this was new information but that was fine because to me I was actually happy that they were doing that and I was happy that they were doing that on their end because it's peace of mind mm. like you know 
that way you know that yeah, you don't have it. You want to know for sure. Yeah, rather than just going three days without symptoms and yeah. you'd be like, oh, I've just got a strong Yeah, we want to know you know for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be here if I just had to wait the three days, right? Yeah. I wouldn't know who I could speak to. And yeah, then, we're totally not nervous at all. <laughs> you're back against the wall? Like, <laughs> wearing a hazmat suit? Um, and then they come to your house and they test you. So they come into your kitchen and they they – in there all gowned up the nurses do and they come mm. come and test you and at this point my a registered address was still my so going back a bit sorry i'm all over the place but going back a bit the police they come and check on you right yeah to make sure you're, the, you're there at the airport i'd registered my partner's address of course you weren't there and, you were- and then when i wasn't there they went back to my house and i was in the hotel and they were quizzing my dad my dad had this huge black eye. He just had um, surgery. Oh. And they're like, what's happened? Like, his oh. son, like, cracked it and left. <laughs> and dad's like, no, he's in the hotel. <clears throat> so what would happen is a few times while I was there, the police would call me and they'd be like, can you just come to They the- drive over, you're throwing a chair. And they're like, this guy's a psycho. <laughs> so I put him in a jail cell for ice later. They were like, um, they were like, can you- uh, come to the door. So you, I was like, being like my jocks because I barely got dressed like, every no, day. I'm I was measuring there. the walls right yeah. now. <laughs> you need Can to you wait 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and I went and uh, like we'd stand at the door and the cops would be like, yep, yeah, okay, we know you're there, all good. Then they just drop in on you. And then that day, that day that I left the hotel, they rocked up at the hotel and they're like, can you just come to the door? And I was like, oh, it's the last thing I thought about letting the police know. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, going to be yeah. there, but that's exactly what you need to do. So I was like, actually i've gone back home they're like who said you could do that and it just was all there was yeah. so much communicating with all these different bodies and yeah. at the end of the day i just wanted it to be over because yeah. at that point i felt fine but that's how they stop it from spreading and it's the right thing to do mm. but yeah it, it was just man it was just it was just a circus like dead set like I, I i don't think that if i didn't have even though i didn't have access to the support network in the way that you normally would you know, where I could sit down and talk to my mum mm. or my sisters or my partner or they were still like there, mm. like other side of the door, dropping off food, dropping off clean clothes. Drop- yeah, on the phone. Yeah, you yeah. know, making sure that I was okay, like checking in with me. You know, people, my phone didn't stop ringing all day, every day. Uh. My colleagues at the university, they were sort of checking in with me yeah. periodically. So you got to be grateful for that. Absolutely. And that's like you said before, imagine if you didn't have that. You know, imagine if you were by yourself. Well, exactly. And we've seen that with some people committing suicide and taking it to that extreme, people in that sort of a situation where they, they, they can't handle it. Yeah. And I guess that's the, you know, to bring this conversation you know, full circle, I guess that's my worry right now when I'm, when I'm seeing people is it, it's sort of showing what can happen to, you know, your mental health if you, if you can't leave somewhere for a prolonged period of time. If these sort of freedoms that we have here in Australia that we take we, I'm not saying we take for granted, but they're just kind of life to us. Like we can go get a coffee. Like we can go for a run if we want to do that. If yeah. some, all of a sudden somebody tells you you can't do that, like it, it, it's quite stifling. Mm. Um, it's the right thing to do because how else do you stop a pandemic that's literally killing people? But as an individual, it can have quite an effect, especially if you're on your own. Yeah, and especially people who have pre-existing um, mental illness as well, and then they're thrown into that sort of, of a scenario. But yeah. as you've explained it, like anyone having to go through this is going to have problems because you can't you can't be sick and not be sleeping and be trapped in a room with no sunlight and be yeah. all right. And if you were, I'd, I'd have some <laughs> questions. worried <laughs> about it. Just my prison time, that's yeah. one of the reasons I can deal with it. But you must just have a lot of compassion for people around the world, especially looking at like New York and looking at Italy and, oh, man. and seeing that there's millions of people self-isolating like that for long periods of time and knowing better than anyone what that feels like. Yeah. Um, what's your sense of compassion for the world as a whole now and what sort of feelings have, have come out of going through this? I think that a big part of it and a big part of what we're, what's going to come is people doing like, like this, like people who have been through it explaining it to people because one of the things is that I find the hardest right now is you look at them, people on social media who are sort of, downplaying the seriousness of what we're going through people who are like oh it's just like the flu people like do you know anybody who's got it i'm reading this and it's kind of like yes i had it when i hear about the people who are like laying in hospital hallways trying to get treated and stuff like that i just i know what they're feeling physically and that's not to mention i'm 25 you know the people who are 83 who are sitting there who can who are laying on the floor of hospitals like it's just so you fully get how how it's killing so many people oh 100 man like not to say I was anywhere near anything like that at all, but if you did have 
a, a lung condition, you know, if you had bad asthma or anything like that, or you're more susceptible to things like pneumonia and, and whatnot, like it can turn so fast. And they say that seven to sort of 11 day per- period of when you've got it is when, you know, it's, it's really dangerous. And that happened to be the time that I went into the hospital. Mm. But it was, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a horrific illness. And I was probably one of the ones early on when it started to happen. It was kind of like, you know, we've seen this before, you know, it's just like a flu. Everybody's going to be fine. But the minute I got it, I was like, oh shit, this is the real deal. Like there's no understating how serious it is. And then the more people I see who get it, who are sort of vocal about having it, you realize that it's not, it's not a walk in the park by any means. It's not a matter of just sitting in bed for a couple of days and getting over it. It's a long, long time. And it's so contagious, you know? Yeah. And that's a hard attitude to dispel and and dangerously also in a situation like we are now in SA, which is really good. And I think like, the way that the state's managed it and generally the federal government has managed it has been pretty strong. And now in SA, if we've had days in a row with zero cases, but the danger also in that is that people get complacent and they go, well, there's no cases and we're all sick of our businesses being shut down and the economy not running and it starts to become very vocal that we need to start everything up again. Yeah. And then potentially people don't take it as seriously as they could and say, oh, we don't have it here or it's not that serious. And then that's when you have a, a spike. And that's my worry, man. That's my biggest worry right now is that, you know, I I, I come in complete agreement. So I think the way that the sort of the government have handled it has been perfect. You know, we, it, the numbers speak for themselves. But even speaking to doctors and things like that when I was in at the RA, they still think that spike's coming. And if it's going to come now, it's going to come when they le- loosen up the restrictions. And I just don't want to see more people have this virus because it's so shit and it just knocks you for six. And like, I would hate to see people just resume a normal life, particularly people like small business owners or grandparents who haven't been able to see their grandkids and things like that. You know, they go back to normal, then all of a sudden they're hit with it. Um, fingers crossed that doesn't happen. Fingers crossed you loosen up the restrictions and then things go back to normal. But better off holding out for a bit longer. I, that's my, my feeling. I think that, you know, you wait until the other states and things like that are getting their numbers right down, which everybody is at the moment, but it's, look, you and I were talking about this before. It's impossible to know, you know, what's going to happen. I think that um, being cautious is the, is the way to do it from now on. And, you know, that all of these, that, that there is resources out there to help people. You know, I think, you know, they're doing this testing blitz now. So there's, there's nothing to lose if you've got a, if you've got a cough, you know, don't put it off, go get tested. There's no time like the present to, to know whether you've got it. And yeah, it's, it's just about looking after yourself physically and your family physically, but also mentally as well. And realize that the person sitting at home who you know, has lost their job or, you know, which I'm grateful that I didn't actually lose my job like so many people have or people whose businesses are suffering, you know, just check in on them. And just because illness or no illness, they're still... Everybody, this is affecting everybody in different ways. Yeah, everyone's suffering some, yeah. somewhere. Uh, yeah. How do you feel it changed you as a person? I think it gave me a much greater appreciation for um, social interaction and how much I needed needed that. Like I was so close to begging people just to come and see me in the hotel. I would, I'd be like, yeah, I know that this is, as bad as it sounds, like I know that this is like irresponsible and illegal, but you can stand down there and I'll stand up here in my mask and gloves. I just need to talk to somebody. I think that now coming out of this, I've realized like, how much I like value that. And then my relationship's like a thousand times stronger as well because all of a sudden we were together every day for, for months Then we were told you can't see each other for three weeks mm. and you kind of learn to value that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, and I guess all you can do is take a positive out of it because like, yeah. if you're still here and you're still alive and you went through something like that, then you have to think, well, I went through that. We got through that together, mm. like you and your girlfriend and are stronger from it. And yeah. you got to think, well, that ends up being a good thing even though it was one of the worst things. Yeah. And also, you know, if, so not to interrupt you, but like, you know, when you, um, being somebody who like, you know, has the tendency to get quite down and quite upset, it kind of exposed me to like a new trigger for me. And that new trigger is isolating. You know, mm. I now know that if, if I put myself away, if I feel like that's necessary, I kind of know that if I did just lock myself in a room and was like, you know, fuck everybody, whatever, I would end up worse. Yeah, way worse. Yeah. And I know that now. And that's. With mental health issues, so often that is the tendency, you know, for people who are feeling that way and feeling like no one understands them or, you know, whether they're suicidal or they're depressed or they're like extremely anxious, they want to often isolate and go away from other people. Mm. Um, and 
sometimes getting trapped in your own mind with no one to pull you out of it. If your mind's full of negative thoughts, that's when things get really nasty. Yeah, so couldn't agree more. Like you experienced that in a pretty hardcore way, but it's a it's a very common trait in in people who go so far south is is that self isolation, and that's part of the reason why we want to have these kinds of conversations because either people will be part of them to feel less isolated or at least they listen to them and hear people like you talk um, as someone who's got a tendency to maybe lean into that who now is like, nah, that was yeah terrible. And it is about, and that's why, you know, I'll take a moment to say what you guys are doing here is awesome because it gives you a chance to articulate the way you're feeling. And it's just like writing in the diary, like I was mentioning earlier, if you articulate your feelings, it kind of makes you think about them in a bit more linear terms. Like why was I feeling this way? What was leading me to sort of go down this path? And you can only really do that by talking about it. Yeah, and you really painted the picture. Mm. Like I fully sort of can imagine waking up another room in that hotel, in another day in that hotel room and then looking around and thinking like, how long have I been here? Yeah. And just turning the light on and thinking what's even the point of getting out of the bed and the room getting progressively messier. Yeah. And you just feel so bad and you're thinking, I'm actually not okay and no one's here to help me. Yeah. That's just, man. So, and that's the thing, like, so you know, just, just another thing like that. So I don't know, like, you know, I, I had an environment that I couldn't really control. It wasn't my environment. It was somewhere else, you know. Like, it was, it, it didn't belong to me. Like, I couldn't sort of, I was never really 100% comfortable in a hotel room. Like, nobody's really 100% mm. comfortable in a space that's not their own. No. So it's, it's, it was, yeah, it was hard. I mean, it was definitely my own by the time I finished up there. But, <laughs> um, but it was sort of like the worst possible place to be in that state yeah yeah and yeah and it was and it was all so familiar at least well. you're in australia though <laughs> yeah but that was also kind of one of those things like i knew that i was 10 minutes away from my parents i was next to the racetrack as well i could hear the horses running and things like that and i knew that i was you know i could the, my, the local pub was just down there like i knew it was all familiar and that yeah. kind of made it worse because all that stuff was so ac- was right there but kind of comforting though as well comforting well, especially the fact that my family could drop by and things like that yeah you know and help out so what's the next step now i'm going to try and get back into like just resume my life as of today you know go back to work and just try and figure out what's next for this phd i needed to where because you have to be there to do it well they're letting they're letting me do my third year as my second year so they're letting me can resume it actually here back in adelaide but it does mean i need to go back to scotland so I need to think about that logistically. It might be in a year's time I'll go back there, but we've still got stuff there. We're still paying rent there, so we need to figure out what we're what we're going to do there. But um, yeah, it's just about going back to some sort of sense of normality. And I know normality is not really, you know, as accessible right now with everything that's going on. But there's still things you can do to sort of make it feel like life's still ticking over. Yeah. And how are you now? I feel better now. I feel a lot better now. As of Saturday, when I got that phone call saying I was all clear, I just, it was like the biggest weight off my shoulders. And it was just so simple. I just went for a walk, like, and it was just bound to do How that. How good was that? Oh, it was amazing. I was out of breath. I'll give you the strong tip because my lungs are so weak after all this time. But um, yeah, I feel so much better. Like, I was, I was so angry in those last few days in that hotel. I was so un, uncontrollably angry that I um, just been able to do things again. And, and, and you're not an angry guy. No, well, yeah. yeah Some yeah. people would disagree, but yeah. yeah. But you're you're fairly chilled, like I would have thought. And to be put in that situation, get pushed that far, it obviously shows like a progression to the point where you're not yourself. You know? Yeah. When you're surprised by how your own reaction, you know that something's amiss. And that was like how I was after I like kind of like flipped the switch. I was I was surprised that I could go that far. And once again, after with some reflection, I knew what it was that pushed me to that. It was the fact that I couldn't speak to people i couldn't go anywhere um and that this all being said everything we've talked about that was the right thing to do because it's the responsible thing to do you don't you do not want to give anybody this virus and you do everything you can if you're in contact with somebody who has it you do everything you can to make sure that nobody else has to suffer from from it because that's how you stop it yeah yeah now you've got that message across really well man i'm glad man. i'm so happy you're, you're back to health Thanks, man. I appreciate uh, it. You know, and that you're all, all good after what you've th- been through. And um, also, like, just thanks. And we're grateful for you sharing that. Um, no, thank you, man. Starting to come and, come and share that because I think it's just such a good example for people that there is light at the end of the tunnel, like people who either get it or people who are affected by other people who've got it or who are just living in this world at the moment where everything's sort of upside down. Yeah. Uh, for such a intimate 
uh, portrayal of how grim it can get, but then mm. to see like on the other side of it now, where yeah. like to be honest, it all went to shit, but yeah, it's sort of all gone to shit for everyone, and you just got to get back on your feet, and and you you're here after screaming and measuring the room and throwing the chair <laughs> and you're still here smiling now so. yeah i think um you know and that's a big props to you guys for giving people the platform to talk, tell these stories because it's how people learn and you know it's a bigger cliche as it sounds it gets better like, if you are isolating it will end like, at least we're not going to go on forever you just gonna remind yourself so thanks man i appreciate it if you got something out of this episode please leave a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts it really helps us grow the show so we can keep bringing you the content that matters. If you want to stay up to date with what we're doing and get involved, get onto the Young Blood Podcast Community Facebook group and follow Young Blood Podcast on Instagram. And if you're keen to get in touch with me, email youngbloodpodcast, all one word, at hotmail.com. This podcast was produced by the talented Rory Noak at Podbooth. You can check them out at podbooth.com.au. This is Young Blood. Thanks for joining us. Catch you next time.